weighting our analysis of the internet matters. As an example, consider this 20 figure from a 2015 IMC paper. It shows A as path lengths for different source destination pairs. The red box highlights that when measuring from planet lab notes to random prefixes, only 2% of paths had A as path length of two or less. Measuring path length from planet lab to random prefixes, which is about 100 sources to 100,000 destinations, could be a common academic approach to quantifying the internet given available vantage points at the time. But the green box highlights that when measuring paths from Google to Google users weighted by traffic volume, 82% of paths were of length two or less. Whether we answer a question by considering all paths on the internet is equally important, or whether we weight by the amount of traffic and hence how much the path impacts users, can lead to radically different answers to even a simple question like how long are paths on the internet? These different answers can lead to different research agendas or approaches on how to optimize routes or address other challenges. Unweighted analysis of internet properties are common. I wonder how different we would think the internet was if all these unweighted graphs were weighted. Do outages impact many users? Are most paths with inflated latency congested because they have lots of users? Or long because no one uses them, so we don't care to shorten them? We hope that today will be the first step towards moving from here to here. You may recall that a 2010 paper revealed that most traffic flows between a small number of content providers and user networks. And remember there is a 2012 paper that found that the number of peering links we know about is almost embarrassingly small. I bring these papers into focus because they both reshaped the research community's mental model of the internet structure. They reshaped research agendas going forward, but they also relied on privileged data and so pointed out the inadequacies of the public data we have and the inadequacies of replicable measurement methods we've developed. But what if we could make an internet traffic map? Our idea of an internet traffic map and understanding of the relative traffic levels on routes would have far reaching consequences. It would enable researchers to weight analysis so as to better interpret results, enable more informed decisions from government policymakers and even help network operators better do their job. But you may ask, isn't it too hard? Well, to that we say, internet research is hard. As a community, we've tackled difficult research challenges and have developed ingenious measurement techniques. But you may then argue, you'll need privileged data. Well, nope, our goal is to only use public data and replicable methods so that other researchers can use these tools. We don't wanna wait until someone publishes a paper based on privileged data, like the studies on the last slide. Although privileged data will always be welcome to validate results. Now I bet you're thinking to yourself, these people sound pretty overly optimistic. Well, it's our goal today to convince you the map is possible, but only with your help. So what exactly do we mean by an internet traffic map? I'm glad you asked. We imagine the map consisting of three components, which will each answer these questions. First, where are internet users? And what is their relative activity level overall and for popular services? Second, where are popular services hosted? And what is the mapping from these users to these hosts? And finally, what routes are commonly used between services and users? Building these components will lead us toward our ultimate high level goal of an understanding of the relative traffic levels on routes. We're going to talk about current progress towards each component and some open questions. In the paper, we discuss some unproven measurement techniques and ideas that may be the first step towards resolving some of those open questions and ultimately banishing unweighted CDFs to the dustbins of sitcom history. So first, recent published results hint that building a map may be possible. This figure from a recent paper at IMC shows the number of prefixes with active clients where regions with more active prefixes are shown with brighter colors. To uncover networks with clients, we probe caches in Google public DNS pops using vantage points around the globe. The Google public DNS pops we probed are shown as red dots. Although there's still some work to do in improving coverage in South America, for example, this method of finding clients is close to the coverage of Microsoft, a global cloud and content provider. We confirm by looking at Microsoft logs that the prefixes that we identified as having clients account for 95.2% of traffic to Microsoft. This next figure shows results from our recent paper at SIGCOM. The yellow dots show Facebook servers uncovered using TLS scans, 
Facebook deploys servers in thousands of networks around the world, and we can enumerate them all using a single vantage point. These figures suggest we're well on our way to building the first two components of the internet traffic map. Now, in addition to these new measurement methods, new trends that building a map may be possible. First, paths between users and services are easier to infer. Easier path inference means building component three of the map could be easier since if we could confidently infer paths from users to services, we would not need to explicitly measure them. Paths are easier to infer, first due to internet economics, content providers peer closely with eyeball networks. This trend implies that more paths from services to users are short, direct paths. By direct, we mean the paths go from content providers to eyeball networks. Paths are also easier to infer due to the evolving role of cloud and content providers. We can measure from cloud VMs, allowing us to uncover many of those pesky peering links that were traditionally unmeasurable. Consolidation in the internet also makes mapping services simpler. It's increased adoption and consolidation of internet technology like the eDNS client subnet extension, TLS, Google Public DNS, and Chromium-based browsers that enabled the measurement methods shown on the previous slide. And now, a few providers host services that source most of the traffic, so we can just focus on mapping a few popular providers to get a map that will provide much of the benefit. Let's jump into the components of the map. Our first component identifies where we can find internet users and tells us the relative activity levels. We showed our initial progress a few slides back. We can measure internet activity at the prefix level, rivaling coverage of logs from a global cloud provider, which we verified by inspecting their logs. To fully realize this component, we first need to figure out how to distinguish internet clients, that is anything using the internet, from internet users, that is actual people using the internet. Second, we're good at finding clients, but are still working on ways to measure their relative activity levels. This paper and our IMC paper have initial ideas of how to do that, but there's still lots of room to improve. And third, we may obtain information about relative activity from different measurement methods, countries, and times. How do we combine all this information, taking biases and changes into account? Our second component identifies where popular services are hosted and the mapping from internet users to these hosts. We showed some initial progress a few slides back. We can measure serving infrastructure of hypergiants, including Google, Microsoft, and Facebook. We can also measure mappings from internet prefixes to some services, but not nearly enough, only the ones that support a DNS extension. Some open problems are, first, we need to figure out how to uncover the mapping from users to all popular services, including services that use Anycast and URL-based redirection. And towards this goal, one question is, can we use community-driven efforts to obtain new data sources? As one direction, we envision working with academic institutions to install and study CDN caches in our own university networks. Our third and final component identifies which routes are commonly used between services and users. Note that we say commonly used. We're scaling back a much more ambitious goal of identifying exactly which routes are used at every point in time. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done here. All we can do is measure routes between prefixes and the cloud. But we do have lots of ideas. Given our limited viewpoints on the internet, one question is whether we can infer the routes we can't explicitly measure. This inference could be enabled by inference of unmeasurable peering links, which, recalling that paper from one of our opening slides, is a major problem and is the key to inferring routes with high confidence. Please see our paper for a more thorough discussion of all of our ideas for building these components and the open questions that remain. So these are bold goals and we've covered a lot of ground. We've presented our argument for why we think the map's important, why we think it may be possible now as opposed to before, and why we think the components of the map we presented are the key, valuable, yet achievable elements to focus on. But you may disagree. For example, maybe you think a different component or granularity would be better to focus on. We're excited to hear your ideas. Or maybe you have an idea of a valuable data source that we, that is the research community, could get access to. At the end of the day, building a map will be hard. But our main goal here was to make you excited and willing to work with us to meet this challenge.